Welcome to the Small Giants Fishbowl. This topic is how much to spend on a company culture to truly impact the bottom line. Small Giants know that investing in employees and their company culture is not only the right thing to do, but that it's also good for business. However, they don't always know how to measure the impact that these long-term investments have on their company profit. In this fishbowl, Mill Snell and Matt Morley from Pendleton Street Advisors share what to measure when tracking investment in company culture and what trends to look for over time. Okay, here we go. Uh, we're a business advisory firm in South Carolina. We work with clients in about 15 states um, and almost all of our clients have this similarity that they, the majority of their assets are tied up in one closely held business and they just need specific planning um, and thought around that, um, around that investment. That may be a first generation business or second or third generation or beyond, but uh, they just kind of have a different financial planning exercise that has to happen. Um, our core competency is business valuation. And so we're doing a project right now with small giants with the journey um, to try and assess, is there any correlation between values driven leadership and the value of a privately held business? I think everybody here probably, and, uh, and most of the folks who come to small giants events or fishbowls are privately held businesses. And we know anecdotally that values driven leadership is a really good thing. And uh, we all believe it to be true, but, we're trying to test that and put some data behind it to say, if you do these things, does it increase the value of your company to you and to outsiders? So that's, I guess, kind of how we're approaching this. We're not by any means experts on company culture. We are affiliating with small giants to increase our knowledge about company culture and what that means for our own company and for our clients. Uh, but we have this interesting perspective where uh, we tend to interact with businesses when they reach this cross section where a lot of things come to a head at one specific defining moment. That may be a transition in ownership. It might be uh, moving the business from one generation to the next or buying out a minority partner or adding a partner. But business valuation and thinking about the financial health of the business is the common theme around those things. The benefit of that is that it gives us a slightly unique, I think, perspective when it comes to company culture because we're unemotional when we look at culture in other people's business. If it's your own business and you've been pouring your heart and soul and sweat and tears and blood into it for 35 years, then you feel very strongly about it. It's your bait. But when we interact with business owners, we're kind of seeing the culmination of that and what it all really amounts to. Um, Value, though, is a really hard thing to define because if you picture your childhood home, if you had a home that you'd grown up in and somebody knocked on your door and said, I want to buy this house, name your price. You may say this is completely, it's priceless. It's invaluable to me. There's no amount of money that you could put on it. Well, that person has a very different idea of value. They may just like the house and they may just want to pay you, I don't know, twice the market value or something crazy. There's two totally different ends of the spectrum there. What somebody's willing to pay based on the market and you when you're emotionally tied to it. And that's kind of the way that we're beginning to conceptualize expenses on company culture. It's really difficult to pin down. It's really difficult to track. And it almost depends on who you're asking and why they value company culture and investments in company culture. So the way that we kind of are conceptualizing this, I'm just going to draw on this board briefly behind me, is uh, you have these different expenses, and they may be from different places in the business, but we're trying to view them at this pivotal kind of cross-section in the business. And we think about this in relatively unemotional terms because we're not the ones spending the money, and we don't know the people and processes and systems that we put in. But, we're um, things that, and things that only value. Part of what we want to define is what, what distinguishes this. 
What are the things that you value that no one may pay you for when you invest in company culture? And what are the things that are universally transferable in terms of investment and culture? And so if you can imagine that down into this funnel, where we're asking a question about value. And there's three main components of value. And this is kind of a scientific approach to business valuation, but we can talk about it in, I think, pretty easy to understand terms. The three basic components of value are growth, risk, and cash flow. And so you can, you can imagine a company like Amazon right now is obviously in the news because they just wanted to, uh, to buy Whole Foods. Well, people value Amazon not because of the amount of cash flow that it generates. They value it because they perceive it to be an incredibly rapidly growing business into the future and that there's low risk for that company because they're just gobbling up market share. And so in any company, every one of these three elements is – is being factored in and and they're just weighted in different ways depending on the different variables of your business. But part of what we're kind of curious about to hear from y'all is what are because because we perceive you to be the experts, the people on this on this webinar, what are the objections that you hear to investing or spending money on company culture? You probably aren't the people who object to it, but if you tell people we invest in our culture what did the detractors say? What, what are the objections to company culture expenses? Uh, I'll pipe in. Doesn't leave enough. Well, I'll, I'll, this is Reagan, by the way, and uh, we just invested, I think, for us, for the size we are, an enormous amount in a company-wide event. We flew everyone to Colorado Springs, and that was a, a really huge gift, I think, from the founders. And I just in the last 30 days alone since the event, it's been an incredible uh, cultural return for us. But one of the objections was definitely, you know, there's not enough profit left over. Where does that, you know, that's our R&D budget that we have that we now are shifting over into this. So um, how are we going to offset that? So they definitely wanted to know what, what type, what the ROI potential could be from it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great example. Thanks, Reagan. Mm -hmm. What else? What other objections are there? Uh, so this is Carl. I, some of the stuff I've run into is, uh, one, uh, culture isn't something that you can affect by uh, doing activities and spending money. It is what it is, and it's just it's too large to affect. So that's one uh, viewpoint. The other thing I see a disturbing number of people is, well, you know, uh, we have high turnover, and so if we give something to our existing employees, eh, we're not going to have them around very long, or they're going to be replaced by somebody else. And so, you know, a very short-term thinking on that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting they don't see a correlation between those two. <laughs> I know. That's the, that's the discussion I have with them. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's interesting. What else? And I think, you know, Himza is helping you. Uh, you can chat in or if you want to wave your hands, you can do that. Hey, Mills, this is Ashton. Good to see you, by the way. Hey, Ashton. Um, really long time to see. I know. So um, I'm newly leading a culture effort um, and kind of sharing an HR function here at um, Mojo Media Labs. And what I've actually found is oftentimes I'm the detractor. Like I'm the one coming in and saying, no, we need to scale back here and there because I'm trying to calibrate our way of thinking about culture that it's not spending a ton of money on activities. Like we're doing a luau today, but it's all potluck. I think we spent $26 on it. Um, because I want to reallocate those funds to learning and development, career paths, um, career pathing, reward and recognition, stuff like that. So I'm trying to actually be devil's advocate right now. Um, so we have a ton of buy-in. It's just kind of focusing those dollars. Mm -hmm. Are you there, Ashley? 
And Mills, you have a comment there from Dale. Okay. Um, yep, lack of confidence that investment brings results. Most leaders view culture like the weather. Just wait for it to change becomes the chosen strategy. Interesting. Okay, so yeah, I mean, if we spend the money, what will happen? You know, is it just going to change anyways, whether or not we actually spend on it? Um, somebody else above that, Brian said, I would add to that, uh, maybe there's somebody above me. So, oh, yeah. I would add to that a lot of companies have a fundamental mismatch between leadership's definition of their culture, i.e. the talk, and leadership's embodiment of the culture, i.e. the walk. And when, they're, when they aren't aligned, no investment takes place. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's interesting about this is all of these kinds of comments, if you have others, just chime in. But all of these really come down to this idea of cash flow. We're saying that if we spend money investing in our company's culture, then it reduces the amount of cash flow that we have. And really, that's only taking into effect or, or measuring one component. But what we've seen, I think, from just interacting with some of the small giants companies and the journeyers and, and what we know about working with other businesses who may be values driven, they just don't call it by the small giants nomenclature, is that they perceive there to be a trade-off. Yes, I spend a little bit in terms of cash flow, but I get back in one of these other areas. And I think Paul Spiegelman's company, Daryl Health, uh, um, whether it was written in Finish Big or in Paul's book, uh, Why Is Everyone Smiling? He talks about the trade-off, and he actually had this interesting phenomenon as a call center where if he pulled somebody out of their chair at the call center to invest in their, you know, their cultural well-being and helping them embody the culture of the company, that means they were not there to actually make revenue because they build you know, by the minute or whatever it was. And the average annual attrition in call centers is something like 80% from what I remember from the book. But at Barrel, I think it was between 15 and 20%. So it is tough to think about, you know, I think like somebody else mentioned, it's a longer term thing. It doesn't materialize today, but um, there's, there's multiple kind of components at play. Um, let me just look at these messages really quick. Um, Simple availability of cash wasn't already said it needs to be. Yeah, I mean, you just may not have the dollars on hand. Maybe you should talk to Ashton. $26 on a company luau is awesome. But I, I think that's definitely true. And um, unfortunately, it kind of becomes this scarcity mentality where you just hold on to what you have. That doesn't necessarily make it better as things go on. Um, there's only so much money. Should we spend it on marketing, sales efforts, revenue generating activity? Yeah, Chris, I, I agree. We do potlucks all the time, so kudos on that from Pamela. If we can, I want to come back to this uh, this kind of framework of thinking about the way that expenses on culture maybe get viewed at a pivotal point and then figuring out how are they valuable by looking at it in terms of company value. But um, one of the things that we had talked about with Himza and, and, and Julia and I think Paul was talking very, very specifically and hopefully in a way that's easy to understand about profit. What is profit in a company? And we've noticed that everybody has a different definition for profit or they think about it differently in their business. Um, so, you know, another kind of brief Q&A, whenever we say what is profit or how, or how do you measure profitability in your company? What, what comes to mind? Okay. Pamela says the balance sheet. What else? Can you ask that question again? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Reagan. Um, the question is, when you hear the word profit or profitability, what measure of profitability comes to mind? Adam says the income statement. Vince says reducing expenses. Adam, net income. Yep. EBITDA. EBITDA. Okay. And Justin says EBITDA. Yeah. And I mean, this is good because we're talking about radically different measures of profitability. Um, one of the things that I think you know, may be helpful is we have this graphic that will we'll flip up onto the screen. 
um, that that Matt put together. That um, can everybody see that? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so there's there's different ways to measure profitability of a uh, profitability within a company, and maybe you want to walk through this, Matt. Would that be? Yeah, sure. Order, folks? We'll send this out afterwards, by the way. And, and just briefly, the, the way that we're getting all this is <clears throat> what you guys said, which is the, the income statement and the balance sheet. Those are the two primary financial statements. And I know everybody on the call is probably at a different level of um, comfort and knowledge in terms of your, uh, you know, accounting and financial statements. So I, I, won't, I won't go too deeply into that, but I, really the point is just what Mills was making which was when he asked that question, you guys even had more um, ideas of what profit is than are on this sheet. And there's already so many here, but let me just run through this one by one. So gross, well, and first, let me set the stage by saying in a perfect world, you know, profit would be, um, you know, what you have left over after you sell something and take into account what it costs to make that thing. Um, but in reality, that's, that's never how it works. So we've come up with all these different ways to measure, to measure profit. So starting off at the top, you have gross profit. That's just a basic measure of profit. It's revenue or sales minus the cost to make your stuff. Um, and then operating profit takes into account things like, you know, having office space, paying uh, office personnel, all the other kind of overhead items. Um, Net income is is just uh, similarly a, a little bit more detailed within that. And, and like Mill said, we'll send you this afterwards if you want to get into more detail and more explanation. The, the ones that I want to skip down to are free cash flow. And really, free cash flow to the firm and free cash flow to equity are both important. But what they what they take into account is not just your profit from an income statement standpoint, but also your profit after you do things on the balance sheet. Like you might have, and we, and we run across this situation a lot, where you have a business that uh, generates a lot of profitability, but you don't have any cash left over at the end of the day or end of the year or end of the quarter, and you wonder why. Well, it's because all that growth in sales is still stuck in accounts receivable. You know, that could be one reason. Um, so there's the working capital component. Then you have capital expenditures, which is if you have property, plant, and equipment, you need to invest in a building or equipment um, or anything that needs to be, that has a long life of, you know, between five and 20 years, that's more of a capital expenditure, which doesn't show up on the income statement. So you got to factor it in um, further down. And then debt also, and that includes taking on more debt or paying down debt. And that really gets to the heart of what we're looking at from a valuation perspective, because if we just ignore those things, we might miss some really important components um, of, of what profit really is. So the problem with this is that there's so much misunderstanding that somebody may say, you know, they may talk about profitability in their business and they're thinking about gross profit, which is just the revenue minus the cost associated with gen generating that revenue. So, for example, let's like, let's use Nike. The cost for Nike to make a shoe, minus the amount that they get in sales, is their gross profit. And this is, I think, one very very small example of how culture or the value of a brand shows up. Nike doesn't necessarily spend exponentially more producing the shoe, but they're able to charge substantially higher margins than their peers or than, a, you know, an off-brand shoe, and people are willing to pay for that. Now, that is product-specific. It's not necessarily company-specific, or people don't necessarily do that because of the culture of Nike, but it does help elaborate on the point that Nike has a competitive advantage over its peers because of the value of their brand. And they do things that may help the value of the brand or hurt the value of the brand. Like Airbnb recently is really imploding the value of their brand in a lot of ways because of the company culture. And you can you can understand why that would be happening. You mean Uber? Uber. That's what I meant. Sorry. Yeah. Not not Airbnb. Uber. Yeah. Um, and so 
you know, that's just a, a, a small example in terms of thinking about, you know, manufacturing the shoe. But whenever you think about expenses in culture, where do they show up on the income statement? If you're going to spend money on culture, where does it show up in your financials? It, let, let me just preface this a little bit by saying, you know, people typically look at the income statement in one of two ways. It's either form or function. So if it's form and we're talking about where did things go, you're probably thinking about, well, they go to the person I pay for that or they go to the employee that I pay for that. What we're talking about is more a function. In other words, putting things into broad buckets, I'll give you a few examples. One of the big buckets is personnel that we have. Another one is sales and marketing. Um, another one is, you know, especially from privately held companies, owners. So thinking about like in those terms of how you think about your business, what bucket would you put your cultural spending in? And it can be in multiples, but just that's a broad example. Adam says uh, sg &A, selling general and administrative expenses. What else? Hi guys, I can also see this impacting um, inventory from a labor standpoint. I think there's um, likely to be an increased level of productivity. So I think we might be able to decrease the value of our inventory if we can save on labor and get people more motivated, driven, productive. So, so maybe it's a little too outside the box, I don't know. <laughs> No, oh, I think you're right. So you're saying if you know your workforce responds to the need because they're engaged, then you may not have to have, you know, just years worth of inventory on hand. You may be able to have just the right amount of inventory on hand because right. if you get it in a bind, they could produce. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right now, um, you know, we struggle with employee engagement, of course, like I'm sure everyone on this call does, and our ability to, you know, last minute decide that we need to operate on a weekend, produce on a weekend, our ability to really get employee buy-in is pretty low. Um, so I'd like to see that change. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great that's a great example of how it shows up day to day. Dustin says training, employee engagement, consulting. Um, are those things, Justin, that you guys would do um, or is it a sliding scale or is it all or nothing? I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, we, we budget for intentionally spending money on training and development, participation in various events. We also plan for consulting engagement. Uh, sorry, that's me. All right. And then lastly, we, we spend money intentionally on employee engagement. This is everything from fun activities that we plan. It's to finding ways to engage employees in the community. So. Ashton says culture specific, everything. L and D is that it? Learning and development, reward and recognition, community outreach, engagement, everything rolls into my own ledger, um, including my salary. So that's a new change that we just made to the books um, because we just rolled out uh, GGOB. So we're, we're one mini game in on opening our books to the employees. Okay, okay, yeah. That, that's actually really... Uh, excellent, interesting. We don't really see that too much. I mean, people always, well, a lot of companies will break things out by location or by, you know, um, division, but being able to break it out into the HR so we can see where the money is going is, is um, really, that's really kind of neat. Um, I think another way to think about this is or a way for, for companies to identify where your cultural spend is, is to think, you know, if all you were concerned about was maximizing profitability over one quarter, over a half a year, or over one year, what would you stop spending money on? You know, because what we've seen is if you build a strong culture, it can probably survive without any further investment for at least a year. You know, but after that time period, if you're not spending money on your culture anymore, 
it'll probably start to deteriorate. And I know I'm, I'm overgeneralizing on all that, but I think it's an important thing to think about, especially when we try to answer the question of, you know, how much is too much to spend? First, we have to know how much you are spending. Um, so just thinking about it in terms of that, of if we were to stop, if we were to try and maximize profitability over the next year, what would we immediately stop spending money on? And then we could be able to, to really look and categorize what's what's cultural student. Yeah, yeah. I think Matt brings up a good point, which is, you know, is there any way to really delineate the, between what you would spend on a normal basis, I say normal being if there's no investment in culture, and what you actually are spending on things that are kind of elective, you know? Um, that's a really hard thing to do, but, but I think it brings up a good point, which is how do you gauge, how do companies gauge, one, their financial health, but then also how do they gauge the amount that they're spending on uh, culture-related expenses? Um, we just have a couple of examples that I think might be helpful, because what we found is that everybody that we work with has their own kind of barometer for financial health, and people in every different industry and every different business kind of treat this differently. But like we have one company, we'll just call it company one, that their entire barometer for financial health is the spread of accounts receivable over accounts payable. That's all they measure. And for example, for them, they want that spread to be $200,000 to the good. And it, when it gets compressed, they're really, really concerned. But as long as it's over $200,000 to the good, this company feels like they're in really good financial shape. It leaves out some things, but it, it's worked for them so far. Uh, company two, they uh, are in the death care business and they uh, help deal with bodies and remains and funerals. And they think about things in terms of calls, which is anytime they get a call to do a funeral, that's a call. So how many calls do we have this year? And then layered on top of that, how many of those are being cremated? Because that's like the death knell in that specific industry. But how many calls do we get and how many of those are being cremated? The third company, they bill by the hour and then they pass that through to their employees because they're a software development company. And so they think about capacity utilization. Are my employees hitting 80% capacity utilization or close to 80% capacity utilization on billable hours? And I know, know that if they're lagging on that and everybody's at 50% utilization, that it's going to be really bad. It's going to filter through and take time, but that's the barometer that they use. That's the kind of gauge that they use. And what we found is that the problem is, is that people use relatively fragmented tools. You know, they may check the cash balance in the bank. They may check their spread from accounts receivable to accounts payable. They may just think kind of anecdotally, how many times have I thrown a party this year or have I given people bonuses? You know, it, they're just these separate tools that don't necessarily overlap or streamline or integrate at all with each other. But, but I'm curious, what, what kind of barometer, what kind of gauge do you use either to think about the financial help of your business or to think about the expense to uh, the amount of expense you're spending in culture. Okay, so Ashton, profit before tax mm -hmm. as a just as a measure of financial health. And then beyond that, do you think, okay, if we have X dollars of profit or a certain level of profit as a percentage that then we can afford to spend on culture or do you kind of wait and see what falls out? Of yeah, the latter, but then also asking the team members what they want to do with that and the owners, you know, buying into that. Um, but then also putting that towards. Yeah. Yeah. The Vince is saying honest feedback. So can I just clarify on that one? So how folks are feeling, is that more about how they are feeling about their job there or how they're feeling about how the business is doing? Both. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's great. And, and I think taking that back and, and pushing and maybe drilling down on that a little bit further is – I think that's really, they are going to, you know, probably as frontline folks, they're, they're going to have a good idea of how the business is doing, maybe even before you do. Um, but then also what I've seen come up on the, um, on the chat window a lot, um, if I were to summarize it in two words, it would be employee turnover, um, which is interesting, you know, to think about as, a, as an indicator of, whether your culture is adding value or not. I think too, you know, I guess let's, let's hear from some other folks. What, what else, what other kind of gauges do you use to measure cultural health or financial health in the business? I'll jump in. Um, I think we're we're looking at morale. Not that it's incredibly measurable, um, but we're trying to to get people more engaged. And I think to someone's point earlier, um, someone mentioned the financial health of the company. Go, uh, you know, and maybe the first, maybe the production employees are the first people who actually feel, or maybe I'm speaking from a production standpoint, a manufacturing standpoint, but. Maybe, maybe the crew is the first one to know if the business is doing well. That's actually a, a question that I've got. Um, you know, what, what do we share in terms of our finances with the entire team? Um, what's important? What makes them feel secure? What makes them feel empowered? Um, do you guys all share financial health things? Do you share just, you know, sales and gross profit? I mean, what's empowering and what makes people feel that they're valued and their opinions matter. I think there are a number of people on here who are participating in the great game of business and, and, you know, are, are stewards or kind of proponents of open book management. Um, so it may be interesting to get a little bit more of their feedback because they're doing it, you know, in their specific business and they can see how that, or can tell you about how that's gone and, and just how they do it firsthand. Um, I can I can share from from our company Productive Dentist Academy that we do kind of a hybrid. We're getting into the great game of business, so I call it a hybrid because uh, we're not completely open book with our entire company, but our our leadership team, so our division leaders, they all um, they all get to see um, I think a pretty fair. They get to see the P and L, and for the most part, um, get to have ownership over that. But for the feeling security, I totally agree with what Amanda was saying about morale. It's not just about whether an employee stays, but whether or not they're, um, they're happy at work. So I think morale is really important and you'll know, like signs will show up, like that person will start calling in sick or they'll be late or they'll want to, you know, get out early. They won't be very helpful for the team. And we've worked really, really hard for the past 12 months to kind of foster that environment of helpfulness and servant leadership for everybody. Um, and one of the ways that we did that was I started sharing, I just call it the vision and the journey. So people like to be in the know um, and you want to, you don't have to know all the details, but you definitely, it's good to share that the company, um, I call it evergreen. So I say we're, we're evergreen right now, meaning that we're sustainable. We're healthy as a company where, you know, our bills are paid. We have, um, you know, we have a good portion to invest in. We are, we're healthy. So that, that, I think helps right away with the security of it. And then also where each division is going. So we have a marketing agency letting them know, we appreciate your work as it is. We know when we get to um, this particular metric or goal, we're going to have to hire new people or we're going to, you know, we're going to be growing into this. And I think that helps increase morale also because they don't, they, they don't uh, feel like, Oh my gosh, they're just going to work me to death, you know, to make a buck sort of thing. They can, they kind of share on that journey. So that's what we've done in between going full on great game of business. <laughs> so can I ask a question piggybacking off of that Reagan and anyone else that wants to jump in? Um, it seems like, or, or from your perspective, Reagan, um, sharing with the, the supervisors is the entire P&L and then sharing with the rest of the team is perhaps just a general sense of how things are going. So 
you know, I, the last thing I want to do is alienate with too much information. I don't want yes. to question what the heck is going on and I don't know <laughs> what these metrics mean. So maybe just like a, you know, red, yellow, green situation, like good, bad, or ugly. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can share with you how I kind of fell on my face initially. So I've been in my role now for, um, a little over 12 months. And so when I came in and I'm, I'm the operations for the entire company. So when I came in, I announced, you know, gleefully every month when we hit our goal. And so um, what I didn't anticipate through that was what in the heck that even means to each person in the company. So I was operating off of what I, my knowledge was without really telling that background story. So the feelings that you get is and I, I was reached out almost immediately by several team members who were like, they did it privately, but they were like, you know, what is that really? mean and I I want more clients within the company so I don't feel like I'm hitting my personal goal and I was like oh okay so take that into account what each individual team member I don't know how many employees you have at your company but take into account what each at least a group of people if it's a lot would be particular would be thinking about and what does goal mean for them and what does uh, what does health mean to them and anticipate those needs maybe ask a few people that you trust what their thoughts would be around it and we didn't um, we didn't share the PLs right away with the leadership team um, all of us together worked towards uh, we worked towards our monthly goals and we got our I would say it's relationship building so and that's a constant touch in a constant communication once we got our formula down for how we wanted to meet every week to discuss our opportunities uh, that built trust and face-to-face -face time because we're part of us part of our company's virtual face-to-face -face time was critical for that then we were able to go the next step and and invite them in to help us forecasting and planning and that was when we were able to share each they don't see the whole PL, they only see their division PL, and they don't see i think they don't see labor costs maybe they do they see so we we still edit it a little bit for them but they're able to they're able to be really super helpful and contribute and know that their i mean their help is critical and it's valued so I guess would be my my red, yellow, green. Anticipate the folks what they're what what means the the terms. Define the terms, and then you'll be able to explain it. And always explain first, and then explain multiple times. So once is never enough. I think seven is my sweet spot. <laughs> I oh, and the last thing people like to learn either visually. Um, or through audio or through hands-on interaction. I know that for me, I'm visual. Um, I learned that about myself just this year and I'm 38. So I'm like, wow, it took me that long. I have to see it on paper or on a screen for my brain to connect it. So think of that too, when you're explaining things like this to the company, that people ingest information in a, in a different way. So try to, in that seven times that you're going to talk about it, do it different ways. Maybe do it a video one time, in person one time, in writing, in an email one time, something like that. And that's a great point. I've already, you know, for the last couple of months, um, I've been starting to share small little finance metrics. And man, I can see like I've shared it the same way three times and fa faces are glazing over. No, not everyone's engaged already month three. I'll try a different way. <laughs> that's good feedback though on, on open book specifically. Justin, what did you mean when you said we use skip level meetings with staff members to provide additional ways to discuss, engage, cultural investment? Right, so Chris Maynard and I will often skip over the direct supervisor of the employee mm -hmm. so that I hear straight from the horse's mouth. I don't have to get a filtered view of what culture looks like, engagement looks like. It also gives us a forum and an opportunity to actually build relationships, soup to nuts within the business. And y'all do kind of anonymous surveys, don't you? Right. That was what Vince was referring to. We use a tool called Tiny Pulse, and Tiny Pulse allows us to give employees that may uh, be reluctant to share directly, and or it's just it, it's a weekly, a biweekly test of one simple question: Do you feel like your manager um, cares about you? Do you feel like leadership? listens to the feedback you've shared and it's just one question and it takes five to ten seconds and oftentimes somebody will share a little bit more yeah that's right. cool you know i think a lot of this points to or it begs the question of what is the goal of investing in culture is it to have a better company is it to have happier employees is it to 
generate more profit for shareholders? What, I mean, is it because it's just a good thing to do? Why, why invest in company culture? I know that we're probably asking an obvious question, but I think it's helpful to talk about. I'll pause in a real quick comment to simply say, if you're only doing it for return, financial return, I think your motives are wrong. So what motivates you guys, Justin? What, is it because it's the right thing to do? Uh, that's a big part of it. It's the right thing to do. I think we can care for our customers, our suppliers, and each other better if, uh, if we adhere to a set of principles and, and create a culture where we do care and we want to serve one another. Yeah. Mike, I, I'll chime in. I think, uh, I think all those things point to the same thing. So, you know, if you do them all, uh, you, you not only get a great workplace, you, get, you develop a great culture, but the financial rewards come. Um, and a lot of times, not immediately, but, uh, you know, if you think long term about your business, um, you know, it's like, you know, developing a field. It takes, um, sometimes it takes a long time to get the soil just right, you know, for things to really blossom. So I could show up in, could show up in 12 months, could show up in six, but likely two or three years. So I think all those things lead to the same, same place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Carl commented here, creates a more sustainable and stable company. You know, if we, because we think about it in terms of business valuation, and that's our inherent bias, you know, that sustainable and stable company really plays into these factors. It could be more stable in terms of the employee turnover. It could be more stable in terms of cash flow that the business can then use to reinvest into growing. Um, it can create a more, I think, sustainable business in one sense where now the people who are kind of, quote, in charge are not the only ones growing the business or monitoring expenses or caring about product quality, but you have this buy-in from everybody across the board that obviously is going to drive growth and it's going to attract more employees and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Adaptive first time adaptive. Yeah, and I think what just piggybacking on, on what Mills was just talking about, that idea of thinking through, you know, risk, growth, and cash flow as the kind of the pillars of valuation. Of course, we come at it from that viewpoint, but we're really just talking about looking at the same thing things from a bunch of different angles and the thing is your business um, but in terms of valuation what we think and and a lot of it comes down to financial is what you're doing keeping your company financially healthy and growing so that you can do more stuff I don't mean like growing like uh, Amazon has grown but but growing at a pace where you're generating enough cash flow to keep doing the more of the things that you want to do um, but when you think through all those all those cultural um, expenses that you're making, you know what what is it impacting? Sometimes it will, like Mel said, uh, and a lot of times it will reduce your cash flow in the short term. But the reason you're doing it is either because you know it's going to reduce your risk, whether that's because it's uh, reduced employee turnover um, or or any other, you know any. Um, or your personal morale as an yeah, owner yeah. or a manager. Um, like I think what Reagan just said, you know, it makes it a better place to work. Like selfishly, I want to be at a place that's happy. <laughs> right. Uh, so risk, um, or it is going to, or it is going to contribute to growth. And a good example of that is a lot of times culture starts from within and permeates outside. Um, and people are attracted to that, whether it is they want to buy. I mean, I'm not saying anything you guys don't already experience, but whether it's because they want to pay, they're willing to pay you a higher price just because they want to work with you more than your competitor. Um, or whether it's because when you make a mistake, they don't fire you. They just ask you to make sure you don't do it again. You know, so that's where we think about it in terms of valuation a lens uh, from a valuation perspective is, is it contributing to one of those three pillars of value? And 
if you look at one of your expenses or you look at any of them and, and you say it's not doing any of those, then I think the question is, well, then why are, why are you doing it? Uh, but as long as it fits, you know, as long as you're able to look at it through one of those three lenses and see how it is either reducing risk, enabling growth, or even increasing cash flow, then it makes, then to us, that's where we would measure the benefit of cultural um, expenses. Carl, you asked an interesting question. Do you yeah, worry? I was wondering about that because, um, you know, the word valuation is usually attached to, you, it is therefore then measured in dollar signs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I'd like to get your thoughts on what about the space of things that is not traditionally measured in dollar signs, like, you know, doing the right thing just because it's the moral thing to do or, you know, uh, because it's consistent with your personal values, let's say, something like that. Yeah. Uh, that is a huge topic of conversation, and I could probably talk about it for hours, but a lot of it would just be my opinions. Um, but I think that what it really does come down to is, is one of two things, is if, you, if the decisions you're making are going to impact the company financially um, negatively, over both the short term and the long term, then that's one of the benefits that, that you have as an owner or as, as an executive in that business. Um, you just have to, you know, you just have to be careful that you are, that it's, that you're being responsible as a fiduciary. For a lot of privately held businesses, you're a fiduciary for yourself in the end. Um, but for a lot of businesses, even privately held ones that have multiple partners, you're a fiduciary for yourself and your partners. Um, so just making sure that you're being responsible from that point of view. But I think doing the right thing, and I hear that theme, I've heard that theme from different uh, comments, even during this, uh, during this um, webcast, is that uh, it promotes, it actually ends up, um, making your company more profitable, more stable, and probably enables higher growth over the long term, even though it hurts right now. You know, I, I don't know if that addresses your question, but because um, sometimes the uh, it's true that uh, things will show up as positive dollar signs in the future, and so we say, okay, we're doing this. Uh, because it's going to make us a healthier company in the future and whatever. But that's not the entire territory. You know, there's also that space of, um, you know, we don't want to do this or we do want to do this because of our personal belief system. Um, and, you know, that like, you know, treating people fairly. And it's like, okay, we've got a way of defining fair in our business. That's fine. Um, you know, uh, people might argue that your definition of fair, it actually won't produce the largest profit at the end of the day. And we say, but I'm okay with that because I'd rather run this company than run one that has a different set of beliefs. And, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, and that's, and that's totally your prerogative and I think that's really what it comes down to is that if you were a if you were the CEO of a publicly traded company no way in the world that you could you could get away with that um, I, I mean unless you were able to control who owned your company but as a as a privately held business owner or as someone who works in a privately owned business um, that's your prerogative and there's actually some measures in valuation that address that specific uh, fact, they're quantifiable um, discounts to value for being a minority shareholder or, you know, that allow you to take into account that, or, and there's premiums for having total control of a business. Um, and you often see that in the public markets when a company gets taken over. It's usually at some kind of premium, unless it's in a lot of trouble, it's usually at a pretty significant premium to what it's currently trading for on the market. And that's because the company coming in is going to have total control over that stream of cash flow. Um, so, you know, just to bring it back down to our conversation, I think that as an owner, it is your prerogative. Um, 
and that you are exercising that premium for control that, that you have. Justin and I were just compare notes. I mean, I think last year, I know, I know we spent about $350,000 in a facilities upgrade, right, where we, we transformed our entire office to be, uh, you know, totally open floor, open design, um, you know, trying to echo who we are as a team and as an ESOP, um, uh, the idea of being open book, open facility, uh, you know, all that was driving towards the same objective. $350,000 is a lot of money, um, you know, but, um, you know, we felt like it was uh, a true reflection of who we were. We thought we'd see the return in that in terms of, you know, longer term payoff. And then you throw on top of that consulting, you know, expenses around uh, even small giants events, great game of business, those types of things. I mean, certainly well in excess of half a million dollars that we spent last year in what I would call a bucket of, uh, you know, things that aren't necessarily specific tangible rewards that we're going to see. Uh, a payoff for near term, but um, certainly investments worthwhile long over the long stretch. So um, it's again just a longer term, longer view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Reagan, I think you were asking a question too about the about the kind of the trade off. You know, let me go back up. Um, you were saying. Um, how can you increase cash flow when you're investing money to deepen culture? Well, it's a, it's a matter of timing. I mean, you're not by necessity, if you spend money, you're decreasing cash flow, but the trade off is you're hoping to get something back in the future. And that may be, that may not be increased profitability necessarily. It may be that, you know, it's your prerogative as an owner of a business or as a manager over certain expenses that, you may just want to do that because that feels good to you, but I think you're you're getting to a good point where you say, you know, there's there's probably a tipping point. You offer weekly yoga, plan spontaneous gifts and parties, all in company events. I think ultimately, if the purpose of your company is to have the happiest employees in the world, then you could see how that would be in contrast with providing goods and services to customers. And it's a balancing act. You can't say everything we do is only for our employees 100% of the time because then why would you, you know, why would you spend money on anything else that creates maybe a better product or a better service or something like that? So it's probably easiest to define in the extremes. You know it's not way over here and you know it's not way over there, but it's all that gray space in the middle that Ultimately, like we're talking about, identifying what you actually are spending money on is probably the first part of the battle. And then trying to quantify beyond that, are you actually getting a return on that? And that doesn't necessarily, like Carl said, that doesn't necessarily, necessarily imply that it only has to be dollars back into, like say, your pocket to, to be able to say that you're getting a return. That is super validating. Thank you so much. That is exactly how I pitched it. I was very nervous about it uh, coming in in January and the returns that I see are great and it's not just just cash flow. I just was really concerned on how do I measure that? Like how do I really measure increased productivity? I mean, I know, I guess I could look at it by deadlines, deliverables, things like that. And they seem to be, everything's being hit really well. So um, I could put that in a positive bucket. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Hems is saying one or two more questions. Well, can we pose a question to you, Mel? So what are you guys doing at Pendleton? Well, in terms of our own firm, we, we are in the midst of growing where we're adding, we just added two new employees. And one of the interesting, I think, glimpses that we got into company culture and where it materializes or just the rubber meets the road for us is we just hired this guy who graduated from the University of South Carolina in the IMBA program and he had job offers in other places which I'm sure everybody has these stories it was just our first you know in this way but he could have gone and made a lot more money somewhere else but he started factoring in quality of life, standard of living, you know, switching costs to move somewhere else, but also just thinking about 
these are people who hear me and who value me and are going to help me create autonomy in my role sooner rather than later. And what was interesting is that the MBA program was pushing him to go to like Exxon or Alcoa or major, major companies because they want to be able to advertise when somebody graduates, their average starting salary is blank. And we were probably a 30 or 40% discount to that just because it's a risk for us to, to train him, you know, and to kind of help bring him up in culture competently, you know, he, he's got the competence in terms of skill set, but he doesn't know the way that we like to do the work. And so that was an interesting thing. But, you know, I think maybe one of the responses from us that what we ended up doing is trying to meet him in the middle and say, okay, we definitely can't match the salary that they're offering. But we found out what was really motivating to him. And it wasn't just being able to announce his salary. It was, I have a meaningful amount of student debt and I need to be able to contribute in, in that in some way. So we're gonna make some uh, payments each year on the principal amount of the student loan balance because we wanted him to feel hurt, you know, on that. Does that answer your question, Ashton? Yeah, that's awesome. I just wanted to kind of hear from you guys, you know, what you're, you know, what you're up to since we last spoke. So very cool. That's a great idea. I love that idea. All right. We, um, We'll send you guys, or I guess Hemza and Julia will send you guys a really brief article that Matt uh, wrote that has that table of profitability, but it actually, it, it'll be maybe three pages, and it's kind of an annotated version to just give brief descriptions about different levels of profitability because we think that that's just so easily misunderstood. Um, and then if you have any other questions, feel free to email us, and, and we're happy to respond and give you our thoughts on, uh, on some of the things we've talked about. Okay, well, that's it for this one. Check out more fishbowls exclusively for the Small Giants community at smallgiants.org.